Tim Buckley spent his very early life in the industrial town of Amsterdam, New York, before his parents, Elaine and Timothy Buckley, decided to move the young family to the warm and affluent climate of Southern California. They had visions of California being the place where you could stick your hand outside your car window and literally grab an orange from an orange grove. And that just seemed so different and so much more appealing to them than this uh, kind of factory-strewn, working-class uh, town without a lot of career opportunities and life opportunities in upstate New York. The family settled in Orange County, and it was here, amid the fruit trees, that Tim would first begin to develop his musical talent. It wasn't long before he began performing live, and while at high school, he formed what would become known as the Bohemians. The Bohemians was basically Tim's high school band. It was uh, himself and Larry Beckett on drums, Jim Fielder, another high school buddy on bass, and another kid from a uh, high school but from a different town named Brian Hartzler on guitar. And that, that was just a little band that they formed like many kids back then did who wanted to kind of be the Beatles or Dylan. They would put together a little group. They, none of them were virtuosos. And then we would actually get gigs at high school dances who would seem puzzled that some of the time we would sneak in a few originals, play top 40 stuff, play weird, you know, beautiful 60s songs. Larry Beckett would become his closest collaborator, working with him right up until Tim's death in 1975. The pair's creative partnership was cemented during their high school days. Tim wasn't really writing a lot of his own lyrics at that time. Tim was just starting to write melodies of songs, and Larry had poems and lyrics. And so Larry became a perfect uh, conduit for Tim into the world of songwriting. I said to Tim one day, you know, why don't you, like, write some melodies and, and you can, I've got these lyric poems, you can set them to music. And he said, okay. <laughs> and that's how rock and roll was born. As the pair continued to write together, their music became influenced by some of the most seminal figures of the mid-1960s. We never let a day pass without listening to Dylan. <laughs> electric bands that that Dylan made his biggest impact because here was a guy who was doing uh, incredible things with with imagery and wordplay and yet at the same time kind of rocking out and I think they saw in that the first possibilities of life beyond just folk music and banjos and harmonies and, and then they could really kind of experiment with something and take these forms in a different direction. Due to a complicated phantom pregnancy, Tim was forced into marrying his high school sweetheart Mary while still a teenager. It was to be a brief and unhappy union. Keeping their musical ambitions alive, the Bohemians began venturing to Sunset Strip and the cluster of bars and venues that formed the heart of LA's vibrant music scene. See, in Sunset Strip in Los Angeles, about 1965, 1966, it was just incredible. I think it's on par with almost any other regional scene in rock history because you had so much going on and it was so important at the same time. I think the blend of folk and rock, which was pioneered by the birds, was just enormous. You know, this kind of very interesting kind of folk rock scene developing with, of course, the birds and love. Uh, there's a, a really kind of happening club scene taking place. And there was a sense, uh, you know, but there was also an older kind of jazz world. I mean, there's a kind of, you know, underworld of L.A., a kind of, you know, a hidden world of authentic music that is underneath what everybody thinks of as the glitz and the glamour of Los Angeles. One night we were standing outside the trip, and uh, Jimmy Carl Black, the 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 drummer from the Mothers was playing with Frank Zappa and the Mothers inside. He stepped out and, re and Fielder knew him from some encounter, uh, probably musical, and, and uh, Fielder said, you know, we've got a band, we've got lots of songs, we're looking to try to do something with somebody. And he said, well, I'll set a thing up with our manager, Herb Cohen. Herb Cohen was one of the most influential managers in Hollywood. He not only understood the potential of the Bohemians' brand of folk rock, 
but had also managed some of the most eccentric artists the West Coast had to offer, including Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart. Herb was the mother's manager at the time, as well as uh, various other kind of folk rock bands of the 60s. He was a real kind of player on the L.A. scene. And uh, within, probably within a matter of days or weeks, he was, uh, he was working with the Bohemians. Actually, he pretty much fired the Bohemians. He realized, Herb uh, was one of the first people to realize that the real star of the Bohemians was, was Tim and his voice. But he had, I think, already decided that, in his arcane way, that uh, bands like the Beatles and the Stones were going out and, in, and solo acts were coming in. So he thought the best thing to do would be to fire the band and get a contract for Buckley alone, which he then succeeded in doing with Electra Records. Electra Records was a natural home for Tim at the beginning of his recording career. The East Coast-based independent had a history in promoting folk music, and prior to recording his first album, Tim headed to New York and the mecca of the 60s folk scene, Greenwich Village. Tim was doing a regular residence at the Night Owl, where he was hearing people like Fred Neal and Tim Harden and all these um, really powerful singer-songwriters in the village who also became a huge influence on him. While in New York, Tim met Lee Underwood, a fellow singer-songwriter, looking for a deal with Electra Records. It wasn't long before Lee began to appear alongside Tim at the Night Owl Cafe. As I was playing with Tim in the Night Owl, I began to realize, my God, this guy can really sing. He's got some great songs. Uh, he has a way of presenting them that is extraordinarily captivating. Uh, of course, New York was geared for hard, fast, bluesy rock and roll. Uh, at the time, The Who had just come out uh, while the Beatles were doing their thing, Rolling Stones were happening. And Tim's music was subtler, quieter. Well, at first, the crowd didn't quite know what was going on. They were a little restless, and you know, yeah. But as time went on, we played there for one week, another week. Uh, people began to tune in to music. The place, word got around the village that, hey, there's this guy, Tim Buckley, singing at the Night Owl, uh, let's go hear him. And pretty soon the place started filling up. Tim was reaching his audience, uh, and things started moving from right there. Tim returned to L.A. with Larry Beckett and Lee Underwood in the summer of 1966. On August the 15th, all three men entered Sunset Studios to record Tim's debut album. That first album was a kind of compilation of some of the best material that he wrote himself and that he wrote with his collaborator, friend, poet Larry Beckett. So the songs that emerged on that first album were fresh. We were very young, and uh, I, I, I think what makes that album beautiful are, are uh, Tim's performances. Summer princess, midnight maiden, when I first saw you, I just breathed. You hear Tim's kind of keening Irish tenor. You hear these uh, kind of windswept, uh, orchestrated kind of folk rock songs. It's dominated by those kind of songs. And although at the same time, there are some, uh, some moments that hint at what's to come, some kind of darker, moodier songs, I think Tim and, and most of the people who worked on it, including Larry Becca and Lee Underwood, kind of came to dismiss the record much later and thought it was, you know, sort of naive, jejun folk rock. Although you've spoken many times before Wings has a certain power. He had written the first verse and, and not been able to go any farther with it and then gave it to me and then I thought about it and actually went to a SC UCLA football game. Then at halftime I wrote the rest of the lyrics to Wings. But 
I didn't really like the first verse that he had written. I didn't like that it was a composite. I think it was our first collaboration lyrically. So I just said, you know, you, you can have the copyright on the thing and go from there. And it turned out to be a powerful song, though. One day the questions a kind of beauty in the singing and a beauty in the lyrics. You know, if you wanted to be critical of it, you know, you could say it's a little stilted, you know. But it, to me, it sounds, uh, you know, certainly from this perspective, there's a kind of heartfelt quality in it, even, um, you know, even despite its, 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 its kind of highly structured quality. The album was released in the winter of 1966. However, it was not to become a huge success, and even failed to make it into the Billboard Top 200. It did, however, become a striking vehicle for one of Tim's most celebrated talents. Tim Buckley had an exceptional vocal range, and I don't know if it's ever been measured, but it's got to be at or near the top as far as a male vocal range in popular music, not just in rock music, but for any singer over the last 50 years. He used the voice not only to carry lyrics, which he did beautifully, but to, as an instrument in its own right, shaping sounds that were kind of scary sometimes, or, oh, so tender and so sweet, uh, it would just, you know, take your breath away again. During the period prior to the release of Tim's debut album, his personal life became increasingly complex. He had separated from his estranged wife Mary and started a new relationship with another woman. However, towards the end of their relationship, Mary had fallen pregnant with their son, Jeffrey Buckley, and it was becoming clear that Tim had no intention of being involved in either Mary or Jeff's life. Right before the birth, Tim and Mary had a a meeting in a coffee shop near uh, Mary's family's house in Orange County and everyone has a different version of this story but basically you know it seemed to amount to Tim saying well you do what you want to do if you want to have the baby if you want to have an abortion but basically making it pretty clear that he, he was moving on and uh, Mary kind of had to fend for herself in that situation and uh, two months later or so roughly Jeff was born uh, Tim was probably in New York at the time doing some gigs. Uh, he was um, simply not around in any way, and, he was, and, and that was pretty much it. I mean, he pretty much left Mary before Jeff was born. Instead, Tim seemed focused on recording his next record. Herb Cohen suggested that this time around, Larry and Tim should work with a new producer by the name of Jerry Yester. Couldn't ask for a better mid-60s collaborator than Jerry Yester. I saw them coming up, like I heard them first, coming up Kirkwood in this, I think it was a 37 Chevy. Old thing it looked like. Looked like it had been underwater for a year or two, you know, just <laughs> in weird shape. And it sounded like a tank and it came laboring up the hill and I just watched it get in all the way up to the last mm -mm parking place. And there were these two guys that looked like young hobos. I don't know how to explain it. They were just... And they were so defiant, this is Beckett and Buckley. Just, uh, they weren't going to be screwed around by anybody, you know. They, and they just look at you with this kind of little bit of suspicion when they first meet you. But, and, I, and that just endeared them to me. Their first meeting with Jerry Yester at his house in uh, Laurel Canyon, they came with the list of the songs they wanted to do, the, the sounds they kind of wanted. They, they, you know, back then, this was getting into 1967, this was the year of Sgt. Pepper, uh, Blonde on Blonde had come out not long before that. The album was suddenly coming into its own as this art form. 